better known as T.K. Waters. Thanks for joining us, T.K. Um, pr- I appreciate you having me. Thank you very much. All right. Appreciate you and your mobile environment there as you're still on the campaign trail. Well, let's, let's get right to it. What is the state of law enforcement in Duval County today? I think law enforcement in Duval County, I think we have really good relationships. I always think there's always room for improvement. Um, and we, we strive every single day. I know I have in my entire career to, to, to get as close as I can to my community and, and be as close and let everybody know the passion that we have for this community and saving lives and, and taking care of folks. Ooh, that's a big, big question. So the state um, right now, I think it's a lot going on, you know, um, obviously after 2020, the George Floyd, um, I think that our city was turned upside down like many cities across the country. So um, right now, I think that we are dealing with uh, our number one issue is the violent crime in the city, you know, and, you know, we'll be talking about a lot about the relationships, um, the need to bridge the gap between law enforcement and our community. Those are things that we've been talking about and working on for a very long time. But right now, I just think that addressing our violent crime and continuing to work on building relationships in, in our community um, is, is vital. The difference in law enforcement between what takes place at the beaches versus what takes place, what can take place in Mandarin versus what take place in Arlington and what takes place on the east side and west side of Jacksonville. So we're largely driven. Baldwin, for example, Baldwin's different. Baldwin used to have a small police department. They no longer have it. Hmm. So we are, we are, we are handling Baldwin um, just like we handle other parts of Duval County outside of the beaches, of course. It depends largely upon what kind of crime or what, what, what we deal with in different segments of town or different si- sections or areas of town. Um, example, on the west side around 103rd Street, we're dealing with uh, uh, a little bit more violence now. Uh, we've seen that rise uh, somewhat as, as things start to spread out. Uh, Mandarin will have a, a heavy address on property crimes um, and, and some violent crime because it's, like I said, it's not, it's not so much in one place anymore but it's, it's spreading out um and the beaches for example they have their own police department so a lot of times at the beaches depends on atlantic beach we work some of their death cases uh jacksonville beach they're they're, they're completely self-sufficient so it depends on where we are and what we're seeing trend wise um every week the sheriff's office they have what we call crimes meetings and those crimes meetings they discuss the topics and the issues in, in each area of town I know we're all zoned out, but each one has priorities. What are you looking at as priorities do. for these, these different sides? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I can just tell you, uh, crime, violent crime is all over. We have different pockets all over. Crime, you know, um, is everywhere. So obviously, violent crime is a priority. So when you move into different areas of the zone, like in the zone one, the downtown area, you have a lot of issues with transient homeless population. In Mandarin, you may have a lot of the opioid addictions, the the drug. And obviously, Northwest Jacks, Arlington, we have seen an uptick in, in violent crime. And it just didn't happen. It's been happening over the last decade. Hmm. So in 2016, I was able to start what we call our violence reduction strategy. And it was, it was solely built upon, not neighborhoods or zip codes, but it was built upon focusing on individuals that we knew are cr- creating or committing violent crimes in our community. And it drove us to Arlington, sometimes drove us to Mandarin. During that time period, I've, 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 I've had the opportunity from 2016 to 2019 to go to every corner of this city and deal with young men that we know are involved in violent crime. So whereas you might have two, two, uh, 32210 or 32209, where there might be a, a higher amount, um, there's not one side of this city that hasn't been touched or we haven't touched through intelligence, through understanding where the problems are to deal with those issues. Uh, like last year in Arlington, they had a decrease in, in some of their violence in Arlington. Well, a lot of the times we recognize where the gangs were moving, 
uh, where the groups were moving. And we went over there and we addressed those issues. Only if it's going there. Because listen, a neighborhood is an inanimate thing. A neighborhood only is driven by the people that are there. And if the young men that we know were creating the issues are in those neighborhoods, then we go to those neighborhoods and address, and address the problems. Well, I was going to ask this question a little later, but since you made the uh, mention the, the name gang, I'll ask it now. Ten years ago, when I was hanging around the uh, Jackson Sheriff's Office a great deal, they were just getting into the mode, actually about 15 years ago now, they were just yeah. getting into the mode of even recognizing or admitting that we had a gang issue here in yeah. Duval County. Now it's second nature. Are you seeing, and, 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 and of course, I'm assuming all ethnic groups are involved uh, now, uh, just as it is on the national scene. So have, uh, has the, what is the strategy without in revealing too much? What kind of strategy has the JSO adopted to try to deal with this gang problem uh, that's not just African-American gangs, Right. Uh, Haitian gangs. I'm assuming we got some Russian gangs around here somewhere, uh, uh, <laughs> along with a few others. But what kind of strategy have you guys has uh, devised to deal with this issue? So uh, a lot of what I just talked about is involving that same group of people. So we what we know for sure is as a large percentage of our violent crime is committed by a very small number of people. And that's these guys in these groups or in their ga- and these gangs that are out and they they shoot each other um, or they commit violence toward one another. It's just back and forth uh, type type situation. Um, gangs. Uh, I don't know why the, it was a like taboo to mention gangs. Gangs are they're real. But Jacksonville's gang issue is slightly different, was much different than a lot of places. We don't have the large organized gang structures like the, the Bloods and the Crips, although my units uh, a couple years back, took off about 47 members of the rolling 20s here in Jacksonville. But our gangs are mostly hybrid gangs. And what, what a hybrid gang is, is loosely associated groups of young men that get together from neighborhoods, 50, 20, and I'm not naming that particularly, 1,200, uh, it just doesn't matter. But they get together, young and ruthless, they get together and they form these groups and they commit violence, but they're not really associated with a national gang. The Rolling Twenties were, but that was the, the largest one that we've dealt with here in Jacksonville. Most of these groups, about 50 of them, give or take five or 10, um, are very, very loosely associated, but they, they do commit violence. We have a gang problem. I would not deny that. So um, currently our agency is tracking roughly 30, 39 criminal gang, street gangs and 70, 733 documented members. So what I would say is that we have to start looking at early intervention and prevention, right? Um, Reaching out to our young kids at an early age. I was just at a school, uh, elementary school, just last two weeks ago, and I went to take pictures with our young kids and they started throwing up gang signs. So, um, So I think that we need to look at our crime problem, our gang issue, whatever issue we have from a holistic approach. Uh, we have learned over the years that just making arrests is not solving our problem. So I think that we have to invest more in education, prevention and intervention and enforcement. So those who are out here committing um, violent crimes in our streets, they need to be locked up. But there is a whole young generation of young people that are needing guidance. They are needing direction. So I just think that uh, really investing in programs is important to address our gang issue. If you would have- And I'll just say, I'm sorry, but, and it's not even a um, gang issue. I think our young people are getting more involved in um, just criminal activity. They may not necessarily be a part of a gang, but juvenile delinquents I see has increased over the years. And young people are with this new, new technology and perhaps hanging with the wrong people. And obviously, you know, a lot of the social issues that are, are happening in many of our communities that affect uh, a child's life. Now, I put this, uh, I put this to several other others. It's a matter of de-escalation. One of, yeah. the, most, one of the most, I would say, egregious 
situations that are, that showed up for me over the last year was the incident that happened with the young man over at um, San Juan and Cassett Avenue, who was obviously having a mental break. It was late at night. Uh, the final result seemed to be that he pointed the gun at himself. But even with that, uh, the report that I saw that came back said that he was still shot 13 times by officers uh, that evening uh, for no other real reason other than, you know, he had a gun. They appeared to have a gun, but it, 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 there's nothing in the report that indicated he was pointing it at the officers. And in fact, the killing wound was the one when he shot himself in the car, in the passenger side of the car. Is de-escalation still being taught to a great extent at JSO? And if, if not, why not? So that situation that you're talking about, I worked it. I was there after it's over. Mm -hmm. um, do you know, you know, they spent over 30 minutes trying to, trying to talk him into, into, right. into not, you know, just getting out of the car and, I can say this being a father who, who suffered a loss from a, from a, 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 a kid like that. Um, it's very difficult to, to, to be able to get someone to change their mind in a situation like that. Now here's, here's where the, the problem comes in when you, when you start talking about de-escalation and we believe in de-escalation, we believe that we, we want to talk anyone out of violence as, as quickly as best and as efficiently as we can. But, they're standing there. They're having that conversation. He disappears for just a brief moment and they hear a gunshot. They're reacting to the gunshot. Um, I don't know that any one of them understood exactly what had happened at that point. Once it's over, then, you know, us going back hindsight being 2020, we can see what happened because the body cam, the body cam showed us what happened. Um, but de-escalation is definitely something we, that, that we, that we teach. Um, it's just very difficult for me as, as a person on the outside looking in to, to say what they should have done in a situation like that, knowing the circumstances surrounding all of it. You stop a car, it's late at night, there's three young men in, everyone, everyone does what they ask them to do, one does it. Now they have, a, they have a choice. They have to try to talk him out or try to get him to come out, and then the, fire, the, the, the one round goes off, and then they, they fire. And they heard the same shot. Um, I believe the, the, the reason, and it's horrible, I'm, it's horrible. My heart breaks every time I thought, every time I saw it and looked at it. Um, it's just very difficult in a situation like that. That's why investigatively we're looking back now. We're looking at something that's already taken place. And now we are, we're dissecting it. We're looking at it. We're dissecting it. And it's, and it's, it's a little bit easier to say what should have happened, but in that situation, it's hard. It's hard to say what should have happened other than what did. Have you seen, has, have your officers that have served under you and that you serve with, has this been, is this a major part of training? Is it something that's discussed at all uh, among uh, uh, rank and file and, and among the training training that, that they're given? Absolutely. Uh, installation training is something that we train uh, at the academy and, uh, and even at roll calls um, each day. It's a conversation that happens all the time. But not only that, that's why it's important. And I always encourage our supervisors to get out here with these young officers and go on the, on the calls and really train. Uh, these young officers need continuous coaching and mentorship and supervision out there with them so they can be held accountable. But I just think that it's important that we continue to um utilize different um, resources to, to train them. So at the police academy, they, we, they've we even started doing jujitsu um, training as well. So that helps um, officers learn how to uh, physically, without using a weapon, detain and restrain. So um, I just think that that's going to be always important to do. Our agency. No, Jacksonville's not getting smaller. Jacksonville's growing. Um, and I know, I know people are upset about the budget. People say we spend too much money, but about 80% of that budget is non-discretionary salary. Everything else we use to take care of our equipment, our, our officers, um, and the things that we utilize. It's not, it's not. And also it's important for people to know and understand many other cities are broken up county and city. There's a city police department and a county sheriff's office. In many other cities, the county sheriff's office runs corrections and has their own budget. Well, we run, but we, we run corrections out of our budget. 
That's three facilities on top of everything that goes with it. So there's a lot more to the budget than just getting money and just throwing it away. Um, so add to our add to our police department. Add, we, we operate with 1.98 police officers per 1,000 citizens in Jacksonville. The International Association of Chiefs of Police came in and said that we should operate with at least 2.5. I would like to get that number up to at least 2,000 total. That each, each point one represents 100 police officers to get us up to around 2,000. Right now, we operate with about 1,825, give or take a few here and there. Our cap is 1,860 uh, 1865, I believe. So we need to get that cap up to about 2,000 and get that number up. Um, that allows us to cover more area. It allows us to do some changing around that I would like to do um, to make our, our zones more equally balanced with uh, citizens and officers and get our officers closer, closer to our citizens. Um, I want to increase our trust. Make, make, sure that, make sure that people trust us. And, and by doing that, some of the things I just talked about, it gets us close to um, our community again. When I first started, Jim McMillan was a sheriff and we had smaller, smaller patrol areas that allowed me to go into to work every day on my work cycle. And I knew the people on that beat. I knew the people that and they knew me. They knew my car number and we were close. We were closer. We talked to each other. You know, when things when we started losing people, things spread out and it became a little bit more difficult to have that one on one contact with our neighbors and with our community members. The police officers are nothing more than community members that are tasked with doing a job, you know, uh, on a more consistent full-time basis. And thirdly, we got to address, continue to address our body crime. When I left um, the sheriff's office, what, not Friday, to, uh, Friday, not Friday the past, but the Friday before was my last day. I had been allowed to start what we call our violence reduction section. And it is a section solely purposed on focusing on violent crime in our community. In 2020, we had 180 homicides. That's a lot. In 2021, we had 130. Our clearance rate was 78.2%. Um, I want to see that continue to go in that direction. We're slightly up above that. Well, at least when I left, we were slightly up above that, but still trending in the right direction. Um, so patrol, uh, increase our number of police officers on patrol. Um, stay get trust, uh, transparency with our community, and um, continue to fight violent crime in our, in our city. People everywhere deserve to live in peace and, and thrive, and we have to make sure we, 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 we continue to do that. Hold people accountable for doing things they have no business doing. Mm. We're, getting into a, we're getting to a point now where no one wants to be held accountable. That's just like you guys hold me accountable. Everyone should be held accountable. You'll hold me accountable if I'm failing, if I'm fortunate enough to get this office, you hold me accountable if I'm failing. And we should hold people that do things in this community that they should not do. They need to be held accountable. More if you need to, but give me a yes. top three priorities for a Burton administration. Yes. Well, I'll just tell you, um, just from going around this city, talking with people, and obviously we get these surveys all the time, people are concerned about public safety. But the other two things that are, are, you know, coming to my attention is people want more police presence in our community and then also more positive interaction. So those are the three things right now that I'm, I'm listening and hearing uh, from the people citywide. So it just lets me know that we have work to do. And um, I just believe that until we build stronger relationships, building stronger relationships will result in um, more crime reduction. And why, 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 uh, have you always been a Republican? And, and, and you know, why Republican? Yeah, yeah. Why am I a Republican? Because there are certain things that I don't believe, that don't line up with my life, that the Democratic Party supports and I don't support. It, whether it has anything to do with law enforcement, has nothing to do with law enforcement. As a policeman, as a sheriff, we take care of every member of our community. Listen, my family's from Sweetwater, my mom's side. My dad's side's from South Side. Right. Everyone. And they're all Democrats. But when it comes to taking care of people, none of that matters to me. What matters to me is my beliefs, my principles is the reason why I'm a Republican. It has nothing to do with anything other than that. Mm. So who is T.K. Waters? Tell us. That's Thomas. And what's the K in Waters? So who are you? Thomas Kevin Waters. All right. 
I am the son. I am the son of a, like I said before, a 32 year military veteran. Um, I was born in Fort Bliss, Texas because of that military life. I graduated high school in Würzburg, West Germany, graduated college at Liberty University. Um, I've been with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and I joined the Sheriff's Office because my first cousin was murdered in Ramona in the, in the, in the apartment complex when he was 19 years old. That left a horrible feeling in my heart. I saw what it did to my aunt. Um, I saw how the impact that it had on her and all my life, all I've wanted to do is try to save lives. I've worked in many different departments within the sheriff's office. I spent 10 years in homicide as a homicide sergeant where I got a, I got a chance to hold people accountable for killing young men in our community. And the reason I say young men, because there was a lot of young men murdered, young ladies also. But when, when you when my life's goal, my life's purpose was to save lives. That's all I care about. I lost my own son in 2018. I don't talk about that much, but I'll talk about it briefly. And what that did is remind me that parents, it doesn't matter what the kids are up to. Parents don't deserve what comes along with that kind of, with that kind of, that kind of pain, that kind of hurt. So I've spent my entire life being a policeman for those reasons. I didn't start the sheriff's office saying I'm going to be the sheriff. I got to a certain point and said, hey, maybe I can do this. And when I got to this, to this point, I realized that I want to see this, this agency go further, continue to get better, continue to improve upon Mike Williams and Nat Glover and, and John Rutherford. There are some great leaders ahead of me. Um, don't want to erase what they've done. Maybe do something better or maybe even erase something that they've done that I disagree with. But do something better. I, I'm not um, I, I'm just a guy who cares about this community. I love everybody in it. Um, I love people. I'm willing to talk anytime. I, actually, you said something I was shielded for a long time, but I don't know if you know this or not, but when every time there was an officer involved shooting, I was a guy who had to speak about it from 2019 to 2022. Um, so I was just really serious about my job. You know, it came out that I was running from the media, not running from the media. I just don't talk while I'm working. Now that I'm not working, you see how easy it was to get me to come talk? Yeah. I'm good. I'm good. It's not a problem. It's just I just take my job very seriously. I think I owe the community that I think I owed it to them. So <clears throat> it was very important for me to do that. So I'm a loyal guy. I love Jacksonville. I want to see Jacksonville continue to grow and see Jack Jacksonville continue to go in the right direction. And I want to hold people accountable in this community for trying to hurt others and, and victimize other people. Who is Lakeisha Burton? Well, I just tell you, I am a, a woman of faith. I am a woman of integrity uh, obviously, I'm a wife and I'm, I'm a mother, but um, I knew early on in my young life that God wanted to use my life to serve this community. And that's what I've been doing. And I, I got in this race early on because I felt like this, the, 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 the voters of Duval County deserve options on the ballot. Right. I believe that the next sheriff needs to be somebody who is bold and courageous, but also somebody who's been in the trenches that understand how to serve all um, this diverse community and teach our uh, agency how to do the same. But also um, it's important that you have a leader that has the respect of the men and women that's out here doing this job. Again, I can't even stress the importance of um, or the seriousness of how young our workforce is. We literally have a different agency. So, and if you go back and think about our violent crime issue for the last two decades, our violent crime has been ticking up, up, up. So in last year, we finally saw a breakthrough where we saw a 4% reduction across the city. And under my leadership in the Arlington area, we saw a record break in 16% reduction. And, and over there. So I think that spoke volumes, but it speaks to a culture that was able to be shifted in those officers in that zone. And as a result, they were um, they bought into the whole concept of community oriented policing. They knew that we had to put the bad guys in jail, but they understand is equally we needed to be proactive and get out our cars and go into businesses and partner with our faith based and um, business community to address a lot of issues that's going on in our community. And it just shows when we work together, we can get things done. Now, I, one of the things about your biography that intrigued me was, uh, of course, the issues that you had as a, as a young person growing up in this community. But 
and but you and you did of course make it to junior college. But what was I, I missed the part that tells me why you decided to go to a criminal justice career and then apply to be a police officer? What was the what was the, what was it that, that encouraged you to make that turn? It was um, it was a result of me being a survivor of childhood sex abuse. And the person that uh, basically raped me, he was arrested for two weeks and got out. So I always felt like I wanted to be a police officer to make sure that I put all child abusers in jail and all those who victimize people in our community and do a thorough investigation and and lock the people up and they get the, the time for their crime. So. Um, that was really my motivation. And actually, it was the encounter that I had with that police officer after used, years of being abused. My first encounter was negative. The officer told me that I was lying, you know. Oh. So I always thought, you know, um, when people say they've been victimized, we need to listen to them and we need to treat them accordingly and ensure that they maintain their dignity. So I have proud, I'm proud that I have always, um, that's the type of police officer I've been. So uh, so criminal justice was it. Hmm.